Welcome to Cloud Nation Television. Our special guest today is the most honorable Percival Noel James Patterson, who served as Prime Minister of Jamaica from 1992 to 2006. He was the longest serving Prime Minister of Jamaica, a period of 14 years. an international statesman and leader of the Global South, during which he pursued greater links between the Caribbean and Africa, including leadership of the Group of 77 plus China, and during Jamaica's two years on the United Nations Security Council, where under his leadership, pushed for a greater engagement by the UN on resolving conflict situations in Africa. In retirement from political office, former Prime Minister Patterson has continued his advocacy for closer collaboration between Caribbean and African governments and the Caribbean and African diasporas. The P.J. Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies is a vehicle for engaging on the many issues of interest to advance this process of collaboration. Mr. Patterson, it's great seeing you. Welcome to Carib Nation Television. Thank you very much for having me once again. It's always a pleasure, sir. And you have so much to contribute to our program. You recently established the PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies. Please tell our listening audience um, exactly what this center is about, what is your objective, what is your purpose? Let me give you some contextual background. My personal involvement with Africa started during my student days at the University College of the West Indies when I landed in on African soil in Ghana for the first time in 1957 yeah. and went thereafter to the Seventh International Students Conference in Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, at that time, the Cold War was at its most intense. And both the United States and the Soviet Union were seeking to establish some footing in the world through universities and students. That was actually not just my first experience on African soil, but my first engagement in international relations. A few years ago, the Vice Chancellor of University, Sir Hilary Beckles and myself, started a discussion. And that included how to help the university establish its space and identity in the global landscape. At the same time, I was beginning to feel that after my retirement from active political engagement, I should do something before my days of the party arrived to contribute to something which I believe is fundamental, and that is establishing links at every level with the people of Africa from which our ancestors came and the people of the Caribbean to which they came and other parts of the Western Hemisphere, particularly in the United States of America. So the university decided to appoint me as a statesman in residence, the first of its kind. 
and I was asked to develop some special and peculiar role for the duties I would perform in that capacity. And we chose Africa Caribbean advocacy. The word advocacy is of great importance. We are not engaged in African Caribbean studies. There's a lot of that already from which we will draw what has to be done. But as important as it was when we conceived the idea, it became an imperative, an urgent necessity because of two things, the emergence of the COVID pandemic, which didn't start in Africa, but which made the world realize what is meant when we say we live in a global village. And it also pinpointed the inequities for those of us who live in that global village. It also brought into sharp focus how decision making is on the table in that local village. And it highlighted the need for us to re-examine and refashion a new scheme of arrangements whereby those of us, whether we live in developed countries or developing countries have to share one Mother Earth together. It is no hidden secret that the existing world order has become OTOs. It's obsolescent. It was fashioned after the last world war. And to the victors went the spoils. You know very well that at the apex of it is the Security Council, which is charged with the maintenance of peace and security in the world. It's responsible largely for political matters. Uh, for some time now, we have been advocating the need for a supreme organization that deals with economic matters. Because in the world in which we live, we must take into account the reality of the inequities which arise from the prevailing economic system. The Bretton Woods institutions were designed and the UN was designed when most of us from Africa and the Caribbean were still colonies. We were represented at the negotiating table by the imperial masters. Hence, France has a seat, Britain has a seat. What entitles them to that? But the colonial past, filled with exploitation. We are very realistic. We don't think we can change the world. We don't have the power, but what we want to bring together is a body of scholarship which can 
analyze what has happened, what changes are necessary, and we can equip our political leaders with the information which is necessary for them to advance the advocacy for a world where decisions really are taken on a democratic basis, not purely on military might and imperial past. There's another issue which makes it the more important at this time for Africa and the Caribbean to speak with a united voice in all the fora of international organizations to which we belong. We can't allow ourselves to be ticked off. We're not playing games. This is a matter of life and death. What is that other incident of which I speak? Racism has always existed. But racism, unfortunately, is now alive, it's well, it's evident. And when we were taught European history in school, we were told that the assassination of the Archduke of Austria was what triggered the First World War, the murder of George Floyd has ignited a flame which has consumed the attention of the entire world. Absolutely. It's not the first of its kind. But thanks to technology, we could see seven minutes and 20 seconds of the most flagrant act of dehumanization. Nobody would want to kill an insect like that. And so, we are very encouraged by the responses we have gotten. I spoke of the need of scholarship. I, I mentioned the central position of the university in this. We want to work with other universities, other institutions of learning in Africa, with some of which we already have connections. But the George Floyd abomination has reminded us that we have brothers and sisters who come from the same ancestral roots living in the United States. And yes, they are supposed to have the right of democratic expression. But we note with very, very great concern that there are some who are deliberately seeking at the state level to deprive them of these democratic rights so that the American democracy, if it continues down that path, will be a democracy for everyone else, but for people of color. Yes. We think we have a responsibility, an obligation, 
to involve the history, the experience, the knowledge, the intellectual capacity which exists in the United States in furthering the fight, winning the fight, to make sure that in this world, you don't judge people by the color of their skin. Every human being is entitled to enjoy human dignity. It's no coincidence that one of the greatest apostles of that was none other than Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And so much of what he said and how he said it, not only has resonance today, but obliges us in our humble way to try and contribute to the realization of the dreams he held, followed by persons like Martin Luther King, followed by Mandela and others in the forefront of the fight for racial dignity. That's what the center is all about. That background to the center is a very, very interesting and very broad-based one. I saw where it is said that the center will engage to produce a strategic framework for Africa-Caribbean cooperation and action. Could you elaborate a little bit on the level of cooperation that you would be advocating for or the center will be advocating for? and the kind of action to come out of that advocacy? Essentially, what we want to do is to build a bridge that spans the middle passage to reunite the people of Africa. The 54 nations with the 14 nations in the Caribbean. And let me say here clearly, in the Caribbean, we include Cuba, which has played such a leading role in helping in the liberation of countries in Southern Africa and the destruction of apartheid and which still can contribute meaningfully to the process of which I speak by its intellectual discourse and by the advantages which is making in technology. So let's try and segment it. We want political framework that allows Africa and the Caribbean to speak as one, whether it's in the United Nations, the Security Council, the FAO, UNESCO, UNCTAD, the IMF World Bank, although we have limited voices, we want to pursue that as well. What do we mean by that? That the developing world must have access and a fair share of the resources in the world. No continent anywhere has been more exploited than Africa. 
Europe is what it is because of the wealth which it extracted from Africa. Africa paid a huge price for slavery in that it lost a whole generation of young men and women who otherwise would have gone on to deploy the skills that were necessary in the building of Africa in, from the 16th century and beyond. So again, a universal approach. We want to revisit the international arrangements so that this can be observed. At the present time, trade between Africa and the Caribbean and the rest of the world constitutes 3% of global trade. That's unacceptable. It's intolerable. They come, they exploit the resources, they keep them for themselves. Look on what is happening for the rollout of the response to the pandemic. Countries that develop the vaccines keep them for themselves and even more than they need. While other countries in the world are denied timely access to those vaccines. In all of this, I can't omit to bring to the fore the question of climate change. And already we are seeing within Africa migration, which is due, due to the effects of climate change and the destruction of the environment. On at the, another level, we want to improve the levels of trade and investment between the countries of Africa and the Caribbean itself. A very hopeful sign is that for the first time, there was a summit meeting of the leaders of the Caribbean and CARICOM virtual, of course, in which they set out a very broad framework for cooperation. To achieve any of this is going to require fleshing out. Yes, there are institutions like the CARICOM Secretariat, the Secretariat of the African Union, but a lot of it is going to require technical work. We are getting together. We've started well on the way to get a pool of experts in these fields from Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States, working together. Um, to give them the, the, the tools which are necessary um, to achieve uh, that framework. A very, very important element to us has to do with people-to-people -people contact. And here I speak about the fields of culture and the fields of sport. Our contributions to those fields worldwide 
is a indisputable. But we need to bring our people in. So we would want to have exchanges of cultural groups. We would want to have um, more and more um, teams in the various fields of sport uh, engaged in playing um, against each other. Uh, we, we're not going to be promoting these events. We want to provide the linkages which can facilitate um, the stimulation of those exchanges. And please bear in mind that sports and culture are no longer only just for the lifting of the human spirit, but they are big businesses in themselves. We must get the full benefit of our people. If I may be slightly parochial for a minute, there were times when our best athletes had to go to the United States for training in the colleges there. Not anymore. Right now, our best athletes are trained right here in Jamaica. Whether it's Bull, Blake, Asafa Powell, Bernica Campbell, um, Shelly Ann, uh, Elaine, Elaine Thompson. We, we, we have the fastest living human being on the male side and also on the female side. Think of what could happen if we somehow could hone the skills of the great athletes that come from Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, South Africa. Think of what would happen. We, 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 we could have a competition nearly as big as, as the Olympics itself. Uh, we have to assert our way. Yes. And what we are hoping is that the various organizations and institutions which now exist separately and in fact are duplicating aspects of their work will now find a way of collaboration, of cooperation. And where the advocacy comes in is that we don't want it hidden on shelves and in drawers. We want them to be fed to the political directorate to equip them so that in whatever negotiations have to be done, they speak with knowledge, they speak with uh, facts. When we see the disbursements that have been made, even in the COVID pandemic, uh, by the easing of quantitative restrictions to countries in the developed world, and the tight space within which we have to operate, we are dubbed as middle-income countries. And what that really means is we left to fend for ourselves. We consist of small island states, the um, least developed countries. They're all within um, the African span. Somebody has got to speak up for them in unity 
in strength and we've got to make the developed world understand things can continue as they used to be. And here, let me sound a warning note. I see what I regard no longer as a subtle attempt, but one with fraught with dangerous consequences in the formation of the G20. And appearing to give the impression that the G20, all of which have been selected on the basis of their monetary wealth, could be entrusted with the, with the capacity, though not the authority, to do what was done in Bretton Woods. And I think we must be very alert to that danger. And we must insist we are capable and determined to speak for ourselves. We don't want any advocates speaking on our behalf. We can. That is a very important point you just raised. But before we um, conclude this conversation, I know the center is looking to engage heavily with the African diaspora, um, Caribbean African diaspora. And you also mentioned the word expertise and you have been an advocate of diaspora for a very long time. How do you see the diaspora fitting into this construct of the center's advocacy and going forward? Well, the diaspora has many organizations, some of which you and I know too well. Indeed, one of the oldest was created long before Jamaica began its march to nationhood. Uh, in several places, we have been operating as separate groups related to countries of origin. And while we must still be mindful of giving back to the countries which gave us the opportunities we enjoy, we have to realize that our force, our capacity, our relevance could be greatly increased if we acted together. So for example, Haiti shouldn't just be left alone to fight the Haitian neglect and maladies which it has suffered at the hands of France and the United States. I'm talking, I'm talking plainly. I no longer hold public office, so I don't have to be diplomatic. I, I don't fear reprisals. I'm not hunting for any, any office or any favors, but the time has come when even those of us in the pavilion must be able to say what's happening on the field is wrong, it's bad, 
it must be corrected. So the first thing then is to see if those external organizations can work in greater harmony than has been the case in the past. The second thing would be to fuel the intellectual results of those efforts into a central pool. In the um, Center for Advocacy, we have established various categories of participation. Distinguished scholars, resources, researchers, patrons, friends, communicators. Uh, we have no money. What we have is a wealth of knowledge. <clears throat> I'm not gonna be calling names on this program but already we have got tremendous response from those we have invited to serve with us. We are going to have to um, use the various sections <coughs> of the university community to be involved with us in those efforts. As I said, we're not seeking to replace any organization or usurp anybody else's domain. For, so, for example, we have a center dealing with reparations. That's their focus and main responsibility. We will give them whatever support we can. They, in turn, are helping us to look at how the question of racism is addressed both at the international and the national um, levels. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, Technology these days makes it easier. Um, so for example, um, the conferences we have held, um, the webinars we have conducted, the summit of Africa and the Caribbean was not, did not require travel. There are, however, occasions when I think that physical interaction, that the development of that social relationship, which comes uh, more easily when you meet, will allow us um, the opportunity of really getting to know each other better and being able to harmonize our systems for the collective effort. I couldn't let you go without getting short comment on the climate change conference taking place right now. I, of course, can't say it any better than has been said already in Glasgow. I think our speakers, our prime ministers have handled themselves impressively in their presentation, but that's not new. The 
they have gotten a courteous reception. That's not new. What happens is what are what is going to emerge, not in terms of some bland communique, but a commitment for action, which is measurable and for which there are consequences by failures to meet the goals which have been accepted. It's no longer a country's aspirations. It's what the world needs. Everybody who has spoken that in terms of climate change, as is the case of a pandemic, no country is immune until all other bases are exposed. But some of us are more vulnerable than others. Whole countries in the Caribbean are at risk if climate change goes unchecked. And perhaps the more so in a period when we are no longer dependent on the export of primary commodities or minerals as we once were, but are increasingly moving to a service, service and knowledge centered economy led in our case by tourism as a very significant sector. So we have a saying in Jamaica, what is joke to you is debt to me. Um, we really, we really would like the Glasgow Conference to accept that, to use the words of one speaker, we're not going to continue digging our own graves. Well, Mr. Patterson, I could sit with you for hours to learn from you some of the experiences you've had and you're thinking today and where you want to go with the center. So I, but we don't have that kind of time. So I want to thank you very much for sitting down with us on Carib Nation television and sharing with us your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>